please take the seats. We are ready to start our round table, which is mostly about particular and general trends in the education development and at the Russian education perspective particularly. We are going to have the following format of our activity. I represent two major I'm going to introduce two major participants, uh, Mr. Kuzminov uh, and uh, Mr. Sidenikov Muralev. And in the first row, we have the experts who are within the process of our discussion going to comment on what is going on within this stage. I'm not uh, Alexandra Smolov, so Tatiana Klitschko. Alexander Adamski and uh, Vladimir Uzun. Sergei Kravtsov promised to join us, so he's not here right now. So if he comes, he's going to participate in our discussion as well. The format is going to be the following, dear friends. Prior to this discussion, I will try to single out several issues which are qu quite significant for our today's discussion. Undoubtedly, every participant is going to have his or her own logic of uh, ideas uh, in the form of presentations or other forms, but I would like the experts to pay attention to the questions raised and try to comment on them within your presentations. If we do have time, we will try to talk with the audience to answer the questions from the audience. And at the end, if we do have time, we will try quite a not conventional format, ad hoc uh, quiz concerning the major forks and the crossroads, which are going to be covered within our discussion. If we do manage to do that, I understand that we don't have representative selection, that the audience I guess it, uh, it does not uh, reflect the opinion for the social structure of our society, but it is quite an interesting format from my perspective. The questions of the current trends which I would like to elaborate on and formulate. Though we're going to talk mostly about the Russian uh, case uh, based on the presentation materials provided. Anyway, I would like to draw your attention to the following fact from the perspective of different objectives uh, within the education uh, values and uh, guidelines uh, behind this education system comparative approaches in terms of the ratings and participation in different uh, multinational companies. From this perspective, can we talk about the national systems of education to the extent when we talk about the educationally developed countries in the modern world, uh, Russia, uh, with all the qualifications, uh, can be regarded as a member of such a club or to define the system of education, we are going to have the prevailing specific or prevailing priority. The question is quite general of what kind of different education systems we have. And depending on that, the question to is the same, but the answer may be different. So I'd like you to formulate the place of Russia on the education global map. It is the organic element of this global element, or, as we say, we have our own way to go. That is the first question I'd like to raise. The second question, from the perspective of those possible reforms and maneuvers being discussed within our society. 
so the level of education, let it be preschool, school education, uh, secondary school, general school, high, high school, higher school, all these levels of education, are they vertically integrated system? Uh, one is shifting to another, or each level has its own value objectives and their specific tasks, which can be different from those happening in different layers. Talking about this education system, what do we particularly imply by that? Do we imply several layers, each of which is to be controlled, managed, and analyzed from its own perspective, specific perspective, or there is a special general framework based on which we can discuss this system? This is the second question. And the third question is related to what is called the uh, state policy. Being a representative of the higher education system, and know precisely that all the educational standards adopted over the last years, 3 plus, 3 two plus, a similar processes uh, can be witnessed in different levels. I think that these standards are moving towards the infrastructural issues, the provision of educational processes, and they do not touch upon these content cells which should be in place in some layers of education. I don't know how to regard this situation, so just for the sake of the game, I don't know how to regard this. And from your perspective, from the perspective of the speakers, to what extent the state, and particularly the Ministry of Education, should impact the content of education itself, or the trend, not only relevant for Russia, but for the vote and whole, that the state provides infrastructural conditions and the investment environment, but the content is to be tackled by other groups. What are the groups? Who has the voice in this environment, in such polylog field? What is the current content of education? These are three questions raised. They mostly relate to any presentations of the place of Russia on the global education may, uh, map. Can we talk about the national education systems? Um, can we talk about the education system as a vertical integrated system, or it is a single uh, system which has its own uh, logic and way? And what is the role of the state? So for the start of, I would ask the participants of our discussion, uh, as those who are at this stage and in the audience, try to think about it. And let's kick it off. I give the floor to Yaroslav Vanish Kuzmin. And so within 20 minutes, try to elaborate in this place. I will try to answer the questions raised by organizers. The first, how is Russia go in line with the trend? To what extent is education the part of the leading countries? In this respect, the situation is not bad, but it's quite uh, different. Uh, when we're talking about the secondary school, we are catching up with the leading countries over the last years we have managed to significantly improve our position in uh, international ratings. I would uh, reiterate that this part of these ratings is based on uh, the realities of Anglo-Saxon school. Those who are aware do understand what we're talking about. It, it, it was really difficult to do that, but the Russian secondary school is top 25 percent, maybe even top 20% in terms of the quality of education this is a very significant outcome. And it has one qualification. Uh, 
Kristalina Georgieva, who participated in the panel discussion with Mr. Medvedev yesterday, she said Singapore has the first place in PISA research. I congratulate this president, and he said, why do you congratulate? These are the competencies of the 20th century. It is not the fact that in terms of the digital competencies, the competence of the 21st century has the same rating because it is not in place yet. I'm going to touch upon that a little bit later. Talking about the professional education, uh, we are lagging behind just significantly. We don't have the format of uh, presentation with Sergey. We are going to uh, share what we have been working on for the, over the last years, quite in brief. I'll just give you one example. On average, the financing of the funds for the college is compared or lower with the high school. You know, any other comments are just not necessary at the college uh, joins the functions of the professional education and the technology education. It is the area of huge risk. We do have uh, great uh, breakthroughs in terms of the word skills movement, but it is just a drop in the ocean. And the huge layer of uh, secondary uh, professional tech technical education uh, leaves a lot to be desired. We are lagging behind the major uh, leading countries, such as Germany and France, where it is connected with the high social status, particularly. Talking about the universities, we have a very uh, heterogeneous uh, picture about uh, city universe, city universities have been progressing in international ratings. They are quite uh, objective. Uh, they are demonstrating the function of the research within the universities and the technologies which are taught in universities. We are co growing quite a fast pace uh, and it is more cost-effective compared with China, for instance. But along with that, we have about 50% of students who do not have uh, just uh, attending education, and it is not financed at all. I would like to apologize for not explaining these issues, because we don't have time to do that. The education of adults, it is the hugest area of uh, lagging behind. Now about 50% of adults get education in Sweden, 62 in Germany is 42%. About uh, 40 to 50% of adults uh, getting the education among the leading countries, including Asian countries. So the figures which we're talking to make, we are not lagging quite much behind as other systems of education are richer and they are resisting to new technologies implementations compared with the Russian system, Russian society, since to introduce online course in American university, uh, who are going, they're going to be professors, who are going to say, that, I see, I'm a living creature, so why should we do that? In Russia, there is a huge number of non tending education, uh, Sweden has about 30%, uh, but they have a huge field for the digital technologies in different structures. In some fields, it may be developing faster, in some fields, slower. In online uh, courses, we have about 5 to 7% of international market. Number of Russian uh, higher schools, uh, also leaders on international platforms. Now I'd like to cover the major trend, and the major trend is a digital revolution. Medvedev uh, talks about it, and many of us have done this and read about this. It uh, touches upon the education from two angles. It's a new uh, labor market, so it's a necessity to uh, have new digital competencies and skills. It should be creative. Uh, subjects apart from the digital competencies should be the education of decision making, this 
selection of the options, uh, co communication, cooperation, and presentation, education, those sectors which are in the hands of humans after the labor market is renewed as a result of the digital revolution. And the second is the inner reconstruction and rehauling of the education system itself. There are several sectors and areas. The first is uh, the artificial intelligence and cloud solutions. Artificial intelligence is the self-educating. Artificial intelligence is the reality. It is quite expensive. It is only in labs. But according to the estimates for the heads, for the biggest developing in the research companies, these are Google, Microsoft, and IBM. We have about five to seven years uh, when the paper textbook is going to be replaced. It's not that the paper is not that tangibly uh, pleasant, uh, b but the fact is that the artificial intelligence is going to be quite accessible and affordable and is going to disrupt the whole mythology of uh, the education school, not only in our countries, but in major countries. What is the methodology of uh, general education school? It is a comprehension of the material. Uh, it's quite an obligatory, ob obligatory uh, comprehension. On the one hand, it is a duty. On the other hand, it's the some kind of the lesson, if, if, if you remember that what was applied in the peasants work. So, and the teachers through in five or seven years we can give our estimates we just not know whether the task w was solved by Peter or by Peter's smartphone and Peter's smartphone is going to do that uh, providing uh, explanations and conclusions. Uh, Peter's smartphone can write essays in the standard conventional competitions, so on and so forth. So those routine tasks which on the part of the teacher and the part of the student account for 70% of the older methodology for general education school going to just be difficult to check. Of course, uh, it will be possible not to pay attention to that, but it just means that the reputation of the school is going to diminish significantly. The school will have to adjust. And uh, AI has uh, a chance, a really unique chance, uh, to address uh, different issues uh, that uh, cannot be solved by, tradition, by the school of today. That is, first of all, uh, liberalization of education and individualization of education. Uh, and many people have said uh, that uh, schools uh, have uh, to be in uh, the law on education and artificial intelligence that is embedded in the new textbook of the new generation would be able to adjust uh, to what a kid can do and cannot do, putting forward those tasks uh, that uh, the kid is capable of uh, solving. For example, let's uh, say half of people have uh, a visual understanding of maths and uh, the other half uh, logical understanding. And uh, we can imagine that uh, depending on the success of answers to certain interactive tasks, a completely different method of uh, teaching will be put forward at a very early stage. And that is not all, uh, but as uh, I have certain time constraints. Uh, I'm just uh, referring to the main ideas. Another chance uh, is, uh, of course, online courses and modules. And uh, unlike uh, AI, they are already developed and they are present uh, in the market. And online courses and modules uh, can be compared with the uh, Gutenberg uh, revolution. That is uh, like instead of uh, going after Socrates, uh, you just uh, read a book uh, and uh, in this case lectures and a certain interaction with the best professor, no matter whether they are, is actually accessible to any student and uh, that is not really costly. And it gives uh, really massive opportunities uh, to high schools uh, 
high educational institutions uh, in terms of uh, saving uh, internal resources uh, and uh, pushing up uh, non-creative uh, and uh, non-research part uh, of uh, the uh, professors. And the third uh, sector of uh, technologically growing uh, changes uh, are simulators uh, and uh, augmented reality. And uh, simulators uh, are present uh, mainly in uh, uh, pilot uh, training. And uh, soon, I believe, there will be a chance uh, to manufacture simulators for practically any technology and uh, for learning any set uh, of uh, production qualifications. And the new generation simulator will create an environment around you. So you will not uh, only learn uh, just uh, using some machine, but uh, you can uh, even uh, pretend uh, to be, uh, um, I don't know, a um, hotel uh, assistant, uh, and uh, there will be different examples uh, of uh, different accidents in a hotel, and so on and so forth. And the main result of it all is uh, qualitative uh, change in terms of uh, professor's qualification and uh, status. And uh, all the checks of notebooks uh, is eliminated, but at the same time, there are more requirements. So what is required is project thinking and uh, capability to arrange a discussion, to act uh, as a personal consultant. And school will uh, not uh, evade, will not uh, go anywhere, because uh, no society will reject school. But uh, school will have to fight this AI teaching, as I call it, and uh, will be forced uh, to adjust and uh, either uh, focus on implementation of uh, projects or collective projects or games. And both ways have uh, competition aspects. So schools will be a really colossal uh, hotspot of education and uh, upbringing. And it will be really likely to reform the school, but I hope that it will not reform it in the way that it has been developing in the recent decade in terms of individualization and uh, competition, bad competition. And the uh, structural change of uh, educational market is uh, still an open question. How are they going to change? There are several uh, paths. First is online. And online expands the education market really massively and uh, puts forward new elements of educational market, uh, taking them away from the ordinary regulation uh, from state, because uh, the government can regulate everything which is offline, not online. And uh, another thing is uh, the individual choice and independent choice of educational path. Another way is uh, the need of adult teaching. And uh, the fourth way is uh, the growth of uh, families' income and uh, cheapening uh, educational technologies that would uh, demand uh, further diversification. And that all adds up uh, to market elements in education formation that uh, would be more and more independent uh, towards uh, the state educational system than it is uh, like today. And it will also give birth uh, to absolutely new players, not just commercial providers of online courses, but it will give birth uh, to certain consulting companies uh, and educational coaches. It will also give birth uh, to certain chains of companies uh, that uh, give you micro degrees on certain courses that can uh, be accumulated on the basis of blockchain technologies. And naturally, it will also entail certain platforms uh, tapping the market. Platforms uh, that uh, we now talk about uh, in terms of technologies, online and offline, uh, technologies like Microsoft platform, Volkswagen platform, and uh, I can assure you that a similar platform would soon turn up and 
I don't know whether only Pearson or Prosvishenia will also be there. It depends only on you and us whether we would have time to tap this market on time because its main particular feature that we are sensing now is globalization. There will be no purely Russian educational market five years later and in 10 years this trend will sharply intensify. And you know why? First of all, in 10 years it is highly likely that AI interpreter will enter the market and it will be equivalent to certain technical translation. So it will be just a good ordinary technical translator that will be here. Of course, it will not be like literature translation, but still there will be no problem uh, in terms of uh, educational content uh, on another language. And what it will be like, uh, it is even hard to imagine now. It is hard to see the consequences of this today, bearing in mind just the growth of uh, commercial component in its uh, unregulated part. And uh, even before that, before the final adoption of this automatic translation. Some people call it uh, languagelessness. I do not think that it is languagelessness. But we have other factors of globalization. And as for professional education, now uh, Russia is present at 5% of uh, scientific and technological rentiers. And uh, as for all the rest, we borrow it all. and. Uh, more developed or more successful countries have 10% uh, uh, or 15% of rentier, and uh, the U.S., uh, according to different est uh, estimates, uh, uh, have this indicator at the level of 35% uh, or so. So they also borrow the majority. Another thing uh, is uh, narrowing the sector that is capable of regulating education. Kravtsov is not uh, here with us uh, today, regrettably. I wanted to make him happy with this uh, remark, but I have made you happy. Therefore, the education market by 2030 will be majorly online market, private market, and global market. Economic growth uh, possibility on uh, the basis of education growth. I'm trying to answer the questions posed. So there are three issues here. The first one is the issue of uh, those successful. 25% of uh, working population, uh, uh, or workable population, either do not work or have a very low impact. But developed uh, countries have managed to lower this uh, share uh, down to 10 percent and some even to 7 percent, for example, Finland. And uh, for the economic growth of uh, this country, the loss of uh, this share of human capital is uh, totally inaccessible. Russia is a labor insufficient country. We import a lot of labor and labor force in, and in these conditions to allow our kids uh, to be unsuccessful at school and uh, to go to labor market uh, in an unsuccessful may way that is really not acceptable. So whether the education system would be able to address the problem of unsuccessful, I don't know, Sergei, are you going to talk about it? No, you are not? Then I will really focus on it for a couple of minutes. And unsuccessfulness, uh, as uh, psychologists uh, say, uh, syndrome of uh, learned uh, helplessness is formed uh, 
in the early age because of uh, incapability of uh, parents uh, to deal with their kids. Therefore, in many countries, there is a certain patronage that covers all uh, parents. They just uh, go to visits uh, to parents, uh, see how they play with the kids, and then they see that uh, there are 20 or 30 percent of families with certain problems, and they assist them up to school. That is uh, around. Uh, th that is a very expensive thing, and uh, it uh, will cost around uh, 100 to uh, 200 billion to Russia to cover all the families with this patronage. But this element only can drastically lower the share of uh, school kids uh, that. Uh, are lagging behind uh, and uh, uh, that are prone to autism and so on. Another problem is expanding human capital uh, through radical perfection of uh, collective uh, education. And uh, here there are colossal opportunities uh, for each person uh, that needs a certain uh, remediation education to gain access to ordinary education as well. And the third thing is digital education, so digitalization of uh, education for each and every. If today uh, the share of talented, the so-called talented kids is not uh, over 5%, why? We have a good and one of the best in the world a system of talent seeking. But our Olympic system covers three sectors that is, academic science, very close to school subjects like physics, chemistry, and so on. And the second one is sport, and the third one is art. But I'm sorry, what is beyond this talent seeking system? are such areas of life uh, that uh, account for 90% of labor market and uh, maybe even more. That is technologies, social activities and communications, and uh, technological uh, engineering. And if uh, we can structure and uh, elaborate a system that would enhance uh, the share of uh, talented people, from 10 to 15 percent, it will be really a massive growth uh, in, between, among other things uh, into that part of uh, human capital that is ready to accept it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yaroslav Ivanovich. Sergei Gennadievich, uh, the floor is yours, please. Should we run the presentation? I believe that uh, I will uh, follow on uh, Yaroslav's uh, format, uh, and uh, I will do without uh, the presentation. Or, Tatiana, as we have uh, a joint uh, presentation with uh, Tatiana Klechko, so she will, uh, she will take us through the slides. Can you give the clicker to Tatiana Livovna, please? Do we have a clicker? No, you can just wave to me. Colleagues, today I wanted to present to you our report uh, that uh, was published several days ago uh, in Dialo publishing house, uh, and uh, that is our joint report with Tatiana Lvovna, and uh, it also has a lot of findings uh, of uh, our colleagues uh, that we worked uh, with uh, recently. So it is uh, really a collective uh, effort. And to begin with, I would like uh, to elaborate on uh, what Yaroslav uh, has uh, said uh, about the trends in education and educational development. And I wanted to focus uh, on one trend, and it is as follows. Uh, high education, I, I, I'm focusing on high education mainly.
So higher education is becoming mass education. Practically all school graduates are willing to study at a higher education institution and will do so. And it looks like uh, this trend covers both developed and developing countries. To this or that extent, from half to 80 percent enter universities. Uh, high schools. Whether it is good or bad, uh, it shouldn't be evaluated. It is a trend. And higher education will be mass education. And uh, some years later, practically all will have uh, a higher degree. However, let us uh, have a look at uh, pluses and minuses and uh, good and bad uh, trends uh, that uh, are entailed. So first of all, it's not, of course, a willingness uh, of uh, parents, uh, but that is also the need of economy because uh, we need uh, more qualified labor force. And uh, even if we are talking about uh, merchandiser, uh, they have uh, to have new skills uh, today. So they shouldn't frighten and put off the buyer, well, at least. Another trend uh, that we are going to see, the gap uh, between uh, top 10 percent of student education and lower 10 percent of students will grow because people who can acquire good educations in ancient Egypt or Greece uh, equaled certain amount, certain number of people. Now this uh, number is uh, larger, but still it is restricted. It is restricted uh, by mental capabilities, uh, by industrious uh, nature of this or that person by different uh, preschool and school education that uh, built uh, their life trajectory seriously. And the share of uh, people uh, that uh, are capable of uh, learning and studying well at higher educational institution is uh, maybe growing, but still that is not uh, all the population. And I graduated uh, on the verge of 70s and 80s. And uh, remember, uh, what was the difference between good and bad students there? Good students uh, uh, took their exams in July, and bad students took their exams in August. And uh, now the situation with the unified state exam is uh, something that uh, highlights the situation pretty obviously. And now there are higher education institutions that uh, give uh, good uh, education and uh, others uh, where you can study satisfactorily. If uh, we call a spade a spade, uh, these are education institutions that uh, will accept uh, all. So that is the first trend. The gap in uh, education quality will increase, and the gap between the first and the last will uh, be really larger. Another trend is that mass nature of education in this uh, context will require new technologies. And Yaroslav has spoken a lot about that. And we can assess the speed of their introduction differently. And everybody has their own estimates. But the fact is that it will take place. And these new technologies uh, would uh, have to have uh, to, to enable uh, all the willing people to get access uh, to education and to preserve uh, something good in good education and uh, to enable to teach uh, using the methods that Yaroslav referred to, and it is called generally attainment. And those uh, who cannot uh, study well, if uh, we have traditional lectures and uh, seminars, uh, that uh, today are traditional. And uh, you know how you can uh, learn maths only uh, when you can solve uh, problems after you studied theory. And uh, Olympics can help here, but some competition, I doubt. So in other words, these new instruments and tools have uh, to be used in good education and uh, make it cheaper. But at the same time, uh, they have to teach only in a bad, uh, so to say, uh, segment. I'd like to apologize for this expression, but it is the case. So further on, I'm going to uh, elaborate on these issues. Uh, next block. We need to decide whether the 
uh, gap is growing uh, between the good students who are sending good uh, high schools and uh, simpler high schools. We need to understand to what extent our criteria or the distribution of money in the education system should be defined by a min and max uh, criteria uh, trying to converge and uh, what amount of money should be spent on the talented students. It's kind of a compromise which in a society should be tackled and this compromise which in a big country such as Russia is a compromise itself. So we cannot allocate everything on uh, trying to improve the poor or just to spend on the talented students. We need to do both things simultaneously. The next trend, education is becoming more specialized. Uh, if we create the high education for the mass students, it is to be specialized. How not to lose the formation of uh, uh, just global uh, general education culture, how not to lose, as we used to call it, polytechnical school. It is a particular issue to be elaborated on. The massive approach in education should not should not uh, be in the clash. Uh, such a quality of education is a minority. The economies implied by minority uh, usually those uh, benefits of education, the benefit is the, the education is a benefit, Medicare is a benefit, uh, particularly culture, uh, the, the benefit that can shouldn't be distributed based on the wealth, richness and the power. This is the benefit should be uh, allocated on a different criteria. It is a very significant issue how to do in this way. So, for example, a wealthy person, talented person should pay for the education because uh, he's capable of doing that. And the poor, talented person should have a scholarship or the grant not to pay for the education, not to lose these poor, talented people. It should be adjusted uh, in a customized approach, particularly talking about the massive approach in education. Uh, the, the massive education should require the quality maintenance, particularly in the massive segment. In the leading high schools, we will do it on our own. But in non-leading universities, there are some uh, samples of education uh, programs which are very dangerous to look at even. These are the major trends uh, related to the major era. In order to increase the reach of the higher education among the societies in all the countries. In order to partially solve the issues I've been talking about, and Yaroslav has been talking about as well. Uh, what should be done today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, until 2024, next presidential election campaign? We have been discussing it within the Center of Strategic um, Research, and I'm going to touch upon particular phrases and statements on the I'm not going to give the full list. You have it on the screen. There is an institute, uh, the Unified State Exam. Along with this, all the benefits and advantages, and I see how the rector, uh, as a rector, uh, it's really objective in terms of the assessment of the knowledge of the students, not within the uh, piloting project, but over some years. If the student gets in the profile mathematical exam, over 90, 85 to 90, uh, he's going to be a student of uh, physical technical, uh, just over 90, 95, he's going to be uh, fin financial uh, technologies. If it is uh, uh, 60, so uh, he's going to the the Academy of Foreign Trade, if uh, lower than 50, we try to say that you're not supposed to be in our university. Our scoring is 90 because it is very difficult to get an education. To get education will be difficult, so it tracks the parents, it tracks the students. So we had a survey, corresponding survey. What is bad about the Unified State Exam? The bad thing is that we are uh, seizing to uh, tackle with those disciplines we are going to go through within the Unified State Exam. Here, we need to increase the number, not to lose this uh, general comprehensive culture. There are other tools. M might be 
You mean obligatory? Yes, of course, obligatory. Uh, unified state exam. There are other ways. So we're supporting the idea which is being discussed is the creation of special aid centers for the unified state exam uh, taking. Probably they will manage to release this stress. So it might be taken not within the single year. Why should we even impose this stress on the students if we may avoid this situation? We should think about such a diagnostic approach uh, relating to other disciplines. The average uh, scoring of the school should be taken into account when we enter the higher school. It will allow to uh, prevent the uh, possible uh, loss of this common comprehensive culture. Of course, it is a mobility. I'm talking about the advantages. There are more people who go into Moscow and other huge educational centers from other cities and towns which lack those good universities. Uh, on the other hand, mobility is diminishing the quality of regional higher schools. So why? Because the uh, higher school, strong higher school, is the school of strong students. If the students have low quality, the higher school cannot be very strong, actually. Should I actually speed up? In this regard, we need to provide for the set of the measures which would allow not to diminish the role of regional higher schools. Probably it is necessary to put them under the auspices by the leading uh, higher schools. These are the federal universities, uh, research universities, the least of the president and the uh, VAFT uh, is among those. There are some criteria which have their own standards, particularly. There's a kind of trust on the part of the state towards these higher schools. They may determine their own standards. Such a uh, right is given not to everyone. Yaroslav has said already that they amount to 40 to 45. The next block is how to allocate uh, the scholarship uh, places and scholarships themselves. The first table, please. Here it is. On this table, you can see that formally uh, the control is uh, based on the competition. The more students we have, the bigger figures are. Take a look at the United State exam scoring which is the bottom of the table. Whenever I'm asked that, uh, you know, we tackle social issues, the problematic uh, regions, but please do not call it a competition. It so what is the way out of this situation? How should uh, be located? There is a huge issue. Before uh, saying how to allocate things, I would like to show you the next table. It is interesting to look at. Over the years we've been told that we are teaching lawyers, managers, economists. Who needs that? It is not right. We need uh, to pay attention to technical education, technical engineering education. We take as uh, a structure of the OECD uh, countries, uh, the 2012. We don't have uh, fresh data. It is not that important. We see that it is not quite true. It is not the case. We see that uh, based on those uh, occupations, uh, lawyers, economists, managers, we have the same figures. We are lagging behind in the field of the uh, life science. Those are the people who are going to push the science, who account for the technological and scientific progress and breakthrough within the economic models. It is the only driver of the economic movement forward. But we do not tackle this issue. We do not tackle science issues. There is some statistics, but the uh, physical technical university, what are the graduates? Uh, uh, just I believe that they are scientists. It is the level of this higher school. The trend can be witnessed in this regard. We do lack the physicians, particularly uh, amid the aging of the population. We do lack the humanitarian occupations and specialists. We do lack scientists and scholars, but we have a sufficient number of engineers. What should be done in this regard? We need to allocate uh, these uh, scholarships uh, based on different uh, motives. 
but not to create the illusion that this is competition for the best. It is not the case at all. So what are the best higher schools? Not just the good schools, but these are the schools which are in demand among the population, which are quite fashionable. But they are in demand because they are of good quality. And this is just uh, vice versa. The brand of the high school is very important. It should be taken into account. But we should take into account the needs of, of the state for the specialists. But how to define and out this need? It's very difficult at the edge of the digital revolution. We are becoming a different country. But nevertheless, there are some countries which are outperforming us to a particular extent, and catching up uh, development has an advantage. We can just carbon copy the structure, the system itself. Uh, secondly, we can uh, forecast something in our bachelor uh, system, we have about 45 separate uh, areas. Let's aggregate and uh, allocate about 20, 30, 15 maybe. I don't know the exact figure, but we can forecast uh, what amount of particular specialists we will require in the future. Talking about the poor uh, higher schools, uh, don't they require money? If we might have uh, the problem with the veterinaries, agricultural students, uh, physicians, you know, talking about uh, veterinaries, they are mostly specialists about the cats and dogs, but not about the uh, uh, cattle. But we will require these specialists in the future. We need to allocate money and funds to these uh, highest in schools. So we need to create these special programs to change rectors, to create special uh, incentives to attract students. It's a huge block of issues. We cannot just move along the stream. I'm going to be brief. Let me elaborate on the final issue, talking about the funds for the higher schools uh, per unit funds, which several years ago became implemented and introduced, actually. What is quite bad in this situation? From my perspective, the point is that we're trying to turn uh, this uh, rule of uh, per unit funds into the uh, price. Uh, sh we should not do that. We try to put everything on paper which can be sold. It is not right at all. So why? Because under the rule we see the average uh, price 150 years ago, as Marx said about uh, the expenses, uh, the mm, which determine the price. Uh, how will it cost if we have uh, two students in our classroom? Is it uh, the uh, rule and the norm provided by the Minister of Education? Uh, and some of them are relevant, and some of these uh, estimates are not relevant at all. In other words, the average uh, rate and turn them into a price. And now the Ministry of Finance position is different. But two years ago, we have been talking about this social uh, order reform to uh, turn these education programs into the state procurement program. Uh, have you seen just uh, private uh, high schools? There are about 10 out of hundreds we have. Are they just uh, sell the diplomas, and that's it. So talking about the distance learning and the selling of diplomas, are we going to put a strain on the uh, scholarships for state uh, universities because they give higher prices? It's not right at all. In other f words, this funding from our perspective uh, uh, should be based on uh, some forecasts and estimates for typical uh, higher schools amounting to 90% of all these. These are supposed to be only indirect uh, exp expenses, and the estimate should be based on direct expenses. Why should it be included? We do not understand this logic of the Ministry of Education. We should take a look at the poor higher schools which we require for our society in terms of the professional training and to give the money only uh, based on the uh, overhauling procedure within them, try to replace rector and the staff of the institutions. Unfortunately, I'm 
concluding. So thank you. Uh, further on, we're going to get back to these issues. Dear colleagues, I would ask you to uh, give your input in the discussion of the experts. But I get to draw attention to the fact that, deliberately or not, uh, Irsov Ivanovich talked about the framework programmatic uh, uh, approach mostly related to the comprehension tectonic shifts and further on moved to possible changes in the education system. And Sergei Germanovich had uh, a task of the project and program discussion connected with particular tool sets, how we can do something. Within this range, I would ask the experts uh, try to say maybe to comment on one part in general, maybe to comment on another part. I'm not insisting on that, but I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this combination uh, did happen. And it's very interesting to know the uh, discussions that Irsavanovich mostly talked about secondary school from these uh, pragmatic approach perspective, but talking about the project and program uh, shifts and movements, uh, Sergei Germanich mostly touched upon the higher school. Is it on purpose or not? It's not for me to decide. But I would like to say that this fact is in place. Dear colleagues, I would ask you to uh, give your input within three to five minutes as maximum. Uh, Tatiana Lvovna and Sergei Germanich. Uh, have uh, has been preparing this presentation for us. I will give the floor to her at the end of our discussion. So, Alexander Smov, please take the floor. A presentation, please. Dear colleagues, is it possible to talk about love within three to five minutes? I will try to do that. It's much, it's much, it's much for that. My presentation is called The Silent Revolutions of Why. Why is it called so? And why is it easier for me taking into account these uh, two brilliant presentations to raise questions but not to answer this question? I'm going to elaborate on that. Next slide, please. The situation discussed in these two presentations and everything is happening to our education, to our state. It's really the case. And it is true for many trends in education. It's within the rule of the Red Queen. You see that we are lagging behind, but we need to speed up in order to keep the place. If you want to move to a different strata, you need to move two times faster. When our colleagues presented the idea, in fact, we need to try to keep our seat and to move faster. We need to see how to combine different strategies within the education. In order to do that, I draw your attention to the following fact. There are three complementary strategies within the education. The first one is based on the Nobel Prize winner Tyler when he called uh, all the economic approaches the model of rationality. And this model is discussed within the theory of uh, benefits and the culture of benefits. The second model, which is witnessed more and more when we're talking about the talents, about uh, uh, talented students, about the motives. That is the model of uh, motivational and value optics, where this secondary school is in the frontier and uh, subsurface stone, stones are to be tackled based on the prior approach. And the third one is the model of education as a cognitive behavioral system in information world. In this regard, we have the following phenomenon from wit and understanding of which strategies will lead you to success out of those standards that my colleagues referred to the first uh, strategy of uh, education development please note 
that the majority of strategies that have economic components in the context of rational model implies full blindness to motivation and content of education. So motivation of people and content just fall out of the picture. I don't know where. And when one of the leading economists of the country several years ago, a decade ago, was asked by me about the mid-term and long-term forecasts, and then in uh, brackets uh, uh, he said all forecasts uh, will work uh, if uh, side effects uh, do not uh, like uh, motives of uh, people and sentiments and uh, uh, all the rest of this kind uh, come as a barrier. And uh, that is uh, the well-known uh, formula, I do not see, I do not hear, and I keep silent. And uh, that is this strategy of uh, non-seeing is uh, very visible in preschool, in early education. So in early education, they really do not uh, see it, and Hackman says, that uh, return on investment uh, into preschool and uh, preschool gives much more than uh, return on investment into professional education. And uh, it is when you say that uh, to rectors of high school education, that is like uh, saying about racism advantages uh, to African people. But African National Congress is a ruling party, and they have nailed down the whites uh, for a long time. So the sense is clear, the advantage is not successful. OK. Let's uh, agree on the example later. And here, I believe that without understanding this chart, without understanding that it disrupts the model of rational, like Taleb and Kahneman used to say, nothing will uh, work. And uh, here, the next thing happened. There appears a question without uh, which we will not be able to decide what uh, has happened and what is happening to us. What has uh, been left behind practically totally? Yaroslav mentioned uh, Pearls and uh, Pisa successes, and I focus on them particularly. You can have a look uh, that in Russia we received 581 on reading, and Singapore, which is a role model today, and everybody tries uh, to go there to get Singaporean education, somehow is lagging behind Russia. What has happened? What uh, is behind the scene here? Behind the scene here is a development of uh, new generation standards uh, that are focusing uh, on uh, personalization and variation and Vygotsky's theory. So we have made a breakthrough and uh, instead of following and singing the famous traditional Russian song that is called the cry of Yaroslavna, we managed to win because uh, from 2009 to 2012, we managed to introduce new generation educational standards. And according to Pearl's results, we can see clearly how far and how different Russia is compared to the global average. And we have to become cognizant of that. Why personalization vary? Activity and work with uh, excessive data gives uh, new results. I'm really close uh, to the end, and I understand uh, that I'm always like a Cinderella that is told that her time is up. So in this uh, context, uh, the main thing is uh, to raise a motivation profile of uh, digital education. I call it uh, net or selfie generation, because uh, who wins uh, today are those who are wires. And uh, it is our kids uh, that uh, solve open tasks uh, and uh, problems. And uh, they remain wires uh, through their research behavior, and uh, they win thanks to that. 
and uh, those who we would be even further wires uh, can uh, read uh, Kahneman and other literature. In other words, unless we transfer to new strategies, new complex strategies that uh, combine organizations and economic features, having the question of what uh, are we doing education for. So without that, all conversations about technologies and uh, economy are for the benefit of the poor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Colleagues, uh, let us now get to expert uh, debates. And uh, we have made a very strong move uh, towards uh, discussing the content of education, uh, primary and secondary school mainly, and first of all. And uh, please note that uh, this context, uh, context uh, is uh, in the picture. So, Vladimir Ilyich, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, regrettably, God uh, has uh, not uh, entrusted uh, this gift uh, on me as you, so I'm not going to talk about love. I'm focusing on business and education, a pretty rare and unclear job in the 21st even century. So being a manager, I would try to stick to the agenda of ours today and try to answer the questions voiced by the moderator at the beginning. So the national education system in a modern world was the first one. And I believe that it makes sense to talk about a national educational system today. And furthermore, I believe that uh, any national education system is interesting to the world if uh, it is based and underpinned by its uh, educational archetype, uh, and in Russia, that is traditional deep study of uh, subjects and uh, that is basic scientific approach and uh, that is really good knowledge of uh, basic science, uh, and chemistry, maths, uh, physics uh, and literature. But I believe that it is practically applicable as well. And it would be really silly not to sell what we have. And uh, meeting other colleagues from uh, other industries and sectors uh, that are leading uh, in the US, uh, I can see graduates of your higher educational institutions. So if uh, we cannot uh, employ them in uh, this country, why don't we think about selling them to other countries? And as for the situation with uh, school education, as for the success, uh, Alexander has mentioned them already, and I can say that uh, the score on PISA is growing, but still we are lagging behind. But if uh, we study chemistry starting from the eighth form, the age uh, that they start studying uh, it in other countries is earlier, younger. As for the level of education and uh, autonomous education, it is more like a rhetorical question, but it can have a simple answer, both yes and no, because the school education system is not a vertically integrated company. And every level here is on the one hand autonomous, Whereas, on the other hand, preschool kid life cannot be compared with adolescence life. But still, we have to determine whether there are any results at all. For example, I can give you an example from labor market. Today, who are more de demanded in labor market are experts that are capable of teamwork and initiatives and uh, who are capable uh, of perceiving the global situation in a calm way and afterwards they are not offset by any other level so that is really preschool kids and uh, that is the titanic uh, shift uh, of uh, measures when preschool skills uh, become higher than university skills and it has a global universal strategic meaning the third question that was voiced uh, is uh, more close, is uh, closer to me, and uh, that is, uh, 
responsibility of the state uh, in uh, the content of education, in financial structure. The state and the government is responsible for the infrastructure of education environment and its development. But being responsible and doing it uh, by your own hand is not the same. And uh, in terms of investment into education, here we are facing uh, a really huge uh, problem. And uh, we cannot uh, be in charge of uh, servicing uh, uh, 40,000 schools, uh, talking to each of them. You cannot uh, provide uh, services uh, just uh, to each of them. And then the expenditure of the budget is uh, growing and the quality is falling down because the service is growing in its cost. And it is really critical to talk about it on the verge of budget maneuver. And I can give you an easy example. We have calculated that uh, per one state ruble, we can invest two investment rubles. But uh, what we are totally lacking in our concession mechanisms. So we can also talk about uh, certain transitions uh, and transformations. And if we do not uh, have a centralization or centralized uh, solutions, uh, we will service uh, dozens of thousands of uh, schools uh, differently. And uh, in many countries, uh, that is a huge uh, industry that is manufacturing school equipment. For example, you can try to work uh, with schools in Denmark without uh, Lego. They are really closely intertwined and the whole country lives on the revenue of this company. And I really hope that in 2030 education will be global. But as far as I know today, the government of the Russian Federation has adopted a roadmap up to 2025. And uh, that is uh, focusing on schools uh, going away from cold uh, toilets. and. Uh, Unless uh, we uh, develop uh, the private uh, initiative, nothing will boost here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir, as well. And uh, he said that the main part of this chain and this whole volumetric uh, education system is school education. That was something that you voiced, wasn't it? And now the question connected with uh, the special type of investment in economic strategy that is uh, first and foremost connected with the institutional reforms. At least as for the first idea on Vladimir, our next uh, expert, uh, Alexander Adamski, I believe has something to say and to comment on. And then, uh, Alexander, you are free to speak on what you wish. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Alexander Adamski, and I am going to speak about institutional mechanisms, uh, first of all, and uh, in the context uh, set by Vladimir Ilyich, also I will refer to budget maneuver. And I believe that uh, now the opportunities of uh, budget maneuver is really, uh, are really the main focus. And uh, Regrettably, the speakers did not pay much attention to it because it can become a condition of uh, a great breakthrough or lagging behind uh, on the country. So another idea, a message to economists, uh, so to say. As uh, we are having debates, I expected uh, to hear some clear evidence uh, of how Education can influence economy and how increase of human capital really has an impact on GDP or welfare or competition of companies, increase of their profit and so on and so forth from the keynote speeches. So where are these chains? Because I believe that now we are really taken hostages by uh, some uh, calls and uh, they are on the basis of budget maneuver. There are no clear 
documents or evidence uh, in terms of how human capital uh, increase and uh, human uh, census increase influences uh, economy and uh, welfare of people. That is something that I have not heard at least yet. And another idea for Sergei, education system is uh, totally unbalanced and uh, regrettably we are now facing uh, paradoxical effects uh, when we can uh, discuss uh, teachers' pay rise and then uh, the increase of negative psychological conditions and uh, also society that is uh, put off from uh, education. And Russian educational system is uh, today one of the leaders, uh, that is true, but the society does not see that and does not admit that. A pretty strange and paradoxical situation. Yes, it has always been like that. Uh, there has never been a country or society that is satisfied with education. But today there is a paradox because of the increase of uh, funding uh, from federal funding does not uh, lead to increase of image of education or improve the idea of education in the minds of people. So I believe that it is really critical to understand why we have these results uh, in uh, 2017. That has never been mentioned in the speeches either. And it is really crucial. We have to analyze uh, the tools uh, that uh, took us uh, to our scores in uh, PISA and PEARLS and uh, Olympiads and a pretty visible model here is a Moscow model and the results here are pretty high not only thanks to money but also thanks to vehicles but we also have to understand uh, that uh, education has deferred results so what we enjoy today these are the results of what was implemented uh, a decade ago and then uh, we had uh, priority on national education with the vehicles that we had back then and that was state management of state national projects first and foremost financial projects and then we were operators of national project of education and then the principle of money in exchange of Liabilities worked very well, and now we are facing 30% of underfunding for education, and yet another 30% is lost in transactions that take place before the money is received by schools. So it is lost in the transition from the federal to regional budget, from regional to municipal, and so on and so forth. And now the strategy and policies I changed the, from federal level, I changed it to municipal level really dramatically. And to this extent, I believe that vehicles of implementation of national projects are in such condition that none of the national projects can be fully implemented. And what does it mean? It is education. It is like uh, healthcare. Can you imagine an undertreated person, undertreated individual? So, under implementation of national projects means that uh, the funds invested will give negative results uh, only. And uh, I believe that uh, we are also missing uh, the idea of how the future, the bright future that we are talking about, uh, will turn up. Will it turn up just uh, out of the blue by itself? How will these vehicles, institutional vehicles in the Russian educational system turn up? God knows uh, how, and I believe it will really slow down uh, the uh, success that we are talking about. Thank you very much, Alexander. And uh, I would say that uh, educational content, uh, mostly in secondary school, should be discussed more and more and the significance is growing so uh, Tatiana the floor is yours now thank you very much and uh, could you please run the presentation that we saw before on the prospects crossroads and perspectives
change in the budget allocations for education. So dear colleagues, I'm going to speak on behalf of the Gold Economists, which my previous uh, colleagues have been talking about. Uh, love is love, but uh, as the old uh, joke says, that love was created in Russia not to pay for sex. That's why we're going to talk about for what and how we can pay, as in fact, which is stipulated in the economics of a particular sphere, has a more significant implications and relates to long-term or mid-term plans of development, unlike those things we just imagine. We see the long term trend of the finance changes in the Russian education system. We see the stabilized financing of uh, preschool and general education. Along with that, we, regardless of all the talks within the government, that we need the specialists of the uh, Meat chain, but the financing is diminishing. It means that we do not require such specialists. You know that the money says very important things in very simple way, in a very vivid way. We have a decrease in the uh, higher education financing, and it seems to me that it is a huge mistake. But we hear the voices that we have a lot of students, we have abundance of students, why do we need uh, higher education in these amount? But the point is we are at the edge, which is of utmost importance. Leading American higher schools, which have about 40, 50 students, have the task up to 2030 to increase the total amount of students up to 1 million of students. These are absolutely different universities. We are shifting to trans multinational universities, to the multinational system of higher education at least. It is the answer to the question which Sergei Dvartovich has asked. Secondary school is going to stay national, but when this shift happens within the higher education to such multinational rails, the secondary school is going to catch up. It is difficult to avoid, and we need to prepare for that right now. Next slide, please. In this regard, we are talking about the second budget maneuver. Why should we talk about the second one? The first is the shift of money and the location of the money into the system of reproduction of human capital. In this regard, we calculated and estimated a couple of scenarios. I'm going to demonstrate two of them. One, when the state leaves 3.6% of its GDP for the system of education financing, and they have two crossroads, the nation option and the more optimal option. You can see that in this regard, we can just raise some money f and allocate more money for the system of higher education, and we cannot do anything about other layers of education. If you take a look at the forecast of the minimum need for the funds, this is the forecast when the system of education is just surviving. It's struggling much. So with this 3.6% percent, it is not developing at all. If we increase by 1 percent, which can be allocated according to the official statements, we see that the system is breathing for the early development of children. So what is the maneuver about? It is a strong maneuver. If we're talking about this system of preschool or secondary school education, that is a talk about the long-term development as the early development of a child is the horizon up to 2040. If we talk about the secondary school, it's up to 2030. 
if we invest in the future, we set up particular standards for the future. If we talk about the system of professional education, you can see that with the mid-term professional, mid professional education, as much we desire, we cannot catch up. That's why in this regard, we did a simple thing in order to at least achieve just appropriate level it's the development of applied bachelor system within the higher school in order to develop uh, administrative and management competencies to move them uh, to the uh, higher schools as these executive competencies should be tackled by them thanks to that we may catch up with the financing of the higher school it is a palliative it is a very short term trend. If we do want to join the global race, joining this global race, we should increase up to 5% at least. Higher education gets about 0.9% of GDP. If we move in the lev to the level which is uh, quite average for the OECD countries. So accordingly, we will start to catch up. If we do not achieve this level, we will see the leaders, we will see the self-elite education, which is going to compete uh, leading countries. But uh, these uh, will not be enough for the whole system of education. And uh, at the end of the day, we are not going uh, to move and to achieve the level appropriate for our uh, educational system in order to compete with the leading countries. And to conclude, now we have about uh, 200 million, I mean, global indicator students. Now we have 4.3 million of students in our country. In the US, 20 million students. China and India account for 50 million students. That is the context we are going to work within in the near future. We can increase the amount of our students. It is going to drop uh, by some 24 to 4 million. Then we can uh, start increasing this figure. But we need to take much effort in this regard. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. As I understood from the, your statement that on the one hand, uh, we should pay for sex, but not for love. It is very important to notice, discussing the whole system of education, as it seems to me, formulated the statement that the general uh, system of education is continuing to diversify and on the frontiers of shifts from uh, secondary school to higher education or just from pre preschool to secondary school education, there are some valves which have their own logic, their own content. And these issues should be tackled as well. Apart from the economic component, which uh, Tatiana Lvovna uh, had input in, Dear colleagues, it seems to me, and I will have questions to our two uh, speakers, maybe different questions. It seems to me that it is not quite just in terms of the reproachment for the content within these uh, presentations, at least within the uh, uh, presentation of Yaroslav Vanovic, uh, the forecast connected with the technological trend, which is uh, gives us the ground to discuss the education on all the levels. I might be mistaken. So, Yaroslav Vanovic, uh, can you talk about the content? I reckon that there are several points I'm going to comment on, what has been voiced already. First thing is the state policy and the role of the state. 
which Vladimir Lich uh, has mentioned. The state policy in terms of the education, it is implicitly stipulated. We can generalize. There are three major formats. The first one is an instinctive one. It is a social stability within the society. It has different forms. It has the form of uh, gene code shifting the culture. It is a very important element of the social stability. It has the format of the social mixing, which providing for uh, level playing field based on the talents, skills, but not on the wealth and connections of the parents. And it is bring up function, which has been voiced by the Minister of Education. The Bring up function is very important, and the state policy pays huge attention to that. Very often, it is the case when the state policy uh, just is about motivation, about the patriotism lessons. Any upbringing is the upbringing through activity. The second one is the economic growth, and in this regard, we have practically imitation mechanisms prevailing, to my regret. What is the state procurement, actually? The governor writes what should be done uh, at the cost of somebody's money. If the region doesn't have any responsibility for the money it asks for, it will ask more money. And the logic of this state order is quite simple. If we have about 90 percent live in our region, let's order two, ten times more, and it is not going to be our money. So this correlation between the education and the economic growth should be adjusted. And the third is the technological modernization. The state does understand what should be done. It supports the groups of universities, which are connected with the defense system, with the security, uh, within the focus of global technologies. Here we may talk about the quantitative uh, increase, about infrastructural uh, environment uh, improvement through uh, pedagogic as well. It is the uh, outline of the state policy. The major uh, cap is the connection between the economic growth and education development. Sasha has mentioned it already. We cannot somehow understand why does education need to correlate with the economic growth? Why is it important for the economic growth? They are quite academic. We don't have a special layer between this academic research and the policy, which is voiced within the mass media. Talking about the budget maneuver, I would like to apologize for these different comments on different issues. Talking about the budget maneuver, it seems to me that Sasha Smolov has mentioned it. That there is a focus problem, and Tatiana has mentioned it. We have calculated uh, three ways of budget maneuvers. We have 3.5 GDP uh, to for education. We calculated the minimum is 4.5, which is very close to be adopted. There are some trends even to give lower and allocate lower amount of money. But thanks to that, we can just create the top just to transform the professional education. We do understand why the major losses are there. The one third of the programs are imitation programs. Everybody is aware of that. The major part of the students just enter these programs without the intention to study and the politically approach. And these are the tops, but not the roots. The effect will be seen in three to five years of this transformation. But moving along this way, we practically uh, give up not the prospect of 2025, but the prospect of 2035. 
45, and that is how our children will be successful, those children which are burned today. We talked about the phenomenon of non-success, so in professional education, about 7 to 10 percent can be changed. It is a huge input. It can be seen, uh, but strategically it is going to be a huge mistake to uh, make input only in these fields. The second scenario, 5.2, approximately we calculate the different things. It is a serious full-scale transformation of the general education starting from the pedagogical and psychological uh, paternity. And the third option, 6 plus, is the same, but not to touch any, to include all the interests in the program. Any attempts to implement uh, the ideas of uh, uh, Mr. Lenin, uh, we will see a huge number of people to plan that, to protect the Soviet people from those greedy capitalists who are going to join this program. So if we can avoid this private capital, it's 6.2%. Let's not uh, uh, speak about uh, percentage points, uh, because any forecast is a rough estimate only. What gives the PPP projects in terms of the opportunities? There are some areas. The first is the concession agreement when forming a new educational environment. The state cannot do that. They do not have the enough skills. Let's invite the private business for them to invent a new infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And we, so when are you ready to get your money back? So what is the return payback period? 10 years. Let's listen to the capitalists who are ready to invest in education with a payback period, which do not exist in any other areas, uh, just but in Sechen's case, he has a different uh, scale of reserves and income. It is a very significant. If you are going to write about today's roundtable, I believe that I would work with Mr. Azun, Azun that uh, 10 percent interest return rate, it's in, should be guaranteed by the state, and the business should invest this money as the uh, state is the client. Gref cannot uh, order from himself. It is an exclusion. There are about 10 to 15, and that's it. It should be for all the children, not only for our own children. As this uh, PPP is very important resource in probably the only resource to transform the material base of the education, and this is of utmost importance. As you sit here in this way, but not in this way, include you now dialogue to a better extent. There is a second side of the issue, what we call uh, PPP project, private-public partnership, non-conventional. We have 41 percent of the um, population. We had about two service. They are ready to invest in education of their children from 5 to 15 percent of their current income. Uh, they go in line with the U.S. figures, even higher figures than in Europe. So we are ready as a nation to do that. And it is surprising that the lower deci de deciles, not uh, this amount of money, but people do understand that we need to invest in our family's future. We cannot collect this money. We do not have the skill to do it in the way in order to be quite inclusive for those who are not ready to pay. We need to improve the city educational foundations and to popularize the investment in education. I'm going to give you another figure. 
they survey uh, 2016, about 50 percent of people are ready increase the taxes on themselves to pay extra taxes if they opt for the field, these taxes to be allocated. About 20% are ready to invest in education. Let's not forget about this. But the direct co-payments, if we have direct co-payments, we will destroy the idea itself as we're going to break the society. So we need to opt for other forms which would not hinder the function of the uh, social convergence, social mixing. Uh, can we give the floor to Mr. Barbarodov? Uh, so we, I will give the floor to Sergei Germanovich. There was a reproachment that we didn't talk about the content of education. I'm going to touch upon that. I didn't have just time. A couple of words. There are two imitation institutions, the accreditation of uh, higher schools and Ross Standard. They are just absolutely imitation, reiterating Yaroslav in different regard. They don't have any content. The current accreditation, the huge piles of papers which formally should assess something. So that's it. That's the case. In our standards of the last years, we don't have any content. The content of education in the higher education um, standards, they just are not in place. There are some competencies, so but they're quite diluted. The economists should have these and these competencies, read these and these books. They don't have this information. They have only common words. The same can be seen in the professional standards. Now the higher institutions of Mr. Mao, of Yaroslav, we are implementing the professional standards. Just please take a look at this. It is just crazy. It should bind those who are going to teach something. It is about nothing. A strange set of uh, strange words which can be applied to everyone. It's just a mutation strategy. It should be tackled. I would like to apologize and compliment. I think that it is very important what Sergei has mentioned already. We do have two uh, sets uh, of tools which can be used. Accreditation is not necessary at all. Let's do it on emergency issues. If we want to act within the opportunities and capabilities the state has, which could be used, we shouldn't give up. We need to provide the layers approach. The accreditation procedure should give the consumers the signals on the market, on the quality of education. These are the stars for the hotels. In this case, they would be useful. They would be reasonable. They should be given by the professional communities <coughs> and uh, groups of foreign experts who can compare this quality with the corresponding quality of education in their countries. The second thing is a question of standards as well. We have uh, standards uh, of uh, teachers, educators, and uh, why do we need it? Just uh, to uh, tick uh, that uh, they implemented the order of the president and the president meant professional standards, and that is something that you receive pay in the market. And people just uh, go to receive uh, training themselves uh, to be able to pass professional exam. And it means that it should not be an educator's uh, standard. It should be really a professional standard with different stages or levels. And uh, science and education has uh, so much uh, just... Uh, standards uh, that uh, are ordinary and uh, there are a lot of uh, standards with the stages uh, for metallurgists uh, and welders and uh, that is in demand uh, in uh, industry and uh, let us uh, take the second attempt the second make the second effort because uh, 
I totally agree that what has been done is pure imitation, nothing else. Thank you very much. And colleagues, I have a fork like the education does. Generally speaking, there are really very brief uh, experts' comments, and there is a chance uh, to take questions from the audience. And the third option, as implied, uh, was like a poll. And uh, I would not take on responsibility to say which is the main and most important thing. And I'm not ready to put forward one alternative, uh, so I have uh, discussed it and uh, made a decision. I would give 90 seconds to each expert who is willing to make a comment uh, to the debate. And afterwards, we will take uh, questions uh, from the floor. So I will be really brief. A question uh, to content uh, of uh, education. There is a really huge amount of content. Uh, and the question on uh, creating the structure that uh, this online will be based on is the main question. And uh, can you imagine just uh, the volume of investment uh, that we will have to overlay the infrastructure on. And uh, I would also like to say that apart from the three functions of the state, uh, there has also uh, to be the, the fourth one, uh, that is elaboration of decisions uh, that uh, can be made uh, to attract investment into education. And then we would uh, ripe the effect of the budget maneuver. Thank you, Alexander. I have just one short uh, comment uh, and then a question to Mr. Kuzminov. So comment is that uh, growing quality of education is a challenge to economy. And if uh, school education, I'm not talking about higher education. So if school education uh, develops in that way, very soon we will face a question of where these uh, people that uh, require self-actualization uh, jobs will be self-actualizated. They are not in place. And if this uh, gap between education development rate and uh, economy development uh, rate grows, it will be a social and even social political problem soon. And a question that I have to Yaroslav. <clears throat> what volume of budget maneuver do you think uh, and uh, what are the terms that this decision can be made in? So the volume and uh, the dateline. So now the figures uh, discussed uh, are 0.8% of GDP. And if uh, we calculate investment uh, in numbers, irrespective of that, because this investment has to take place uh, today, that will be 1% of GDP. And then it can go down to 0.8. But we estimated it uh, not in all but uh, several sectors and uh, with the figures uh, or without them we need uh, one and a half uh, times less money than now so that is one of the ways out for russia are you talking about the budget of 2019 yes tatiana uh, Colleagues, that is not Tatiana, that is Alexander Smolov. Out of what has been said, I would like to emphasize something that has been voiced in Yaroslav's remarks. When we invest into preschool and primary school education, we have much more return afterwards as compared to when we try to compensate uh, something at uh, vocational education and higher education. And uh, that uh, entails a question. You said uh, that uh, the income of uh, parents and families uh, is uh, pretty well calculated uh, and the probability there is not low and can uh, Parental income be calculated as a motivation index uh, and uh, index of willingness of parents and families in and interest in education. 
and uh, can it be calculated uh, with engagement uh, in index uh, that has grown uh, in preschool and uh, primary school. Tatiana, I believe that what Alexander Adamski has said and that Yaroslav Kuzminov uh, has responded to, that is a stage uh, that is bygone already. And now at the level of human development, we are among the countries with uh, a very high level of human capital and uh, our economy is lagging behind uh, the level of education that we currently have. And uh, we cannot invest uh, into our economy, even the present human capital that we have, because uh, we are lacking in channels and environment and so on and so forth. Therefore, in my view, now we are going uh, to struggle for the quality of education, but what we need to struggle for is the quality of educational environment and economic environment uh, where this human capital developed at early stages or well-trained uh, at present stages would uh, go to. Thank you very much. Yes, that is a really very interesting and critical thing, and uh, I would uh, take the floor here. Tatiana, you are right and wrong. You are right uh, because uh, the main problem of uh, fast switching uh, on of economic growth uh, is business environment and transparency of labor market. So these uh, two things uh, should uh, be triggered really very fast. And their launch can be implemented as a program and platform of uh, the next uh, president next uh, term of office and uh, that will take uh, not one year for sure historically speaking that will be pretty fast does it mean that uh, what uh, needs to be done now like uh, some colleagues uh, from ministry of economic development are saying that education uh, is something that uh, we should not invest into no it does not mean that and i will explain why there is quality of education, quality of human capital that uh, is uh, breaking through in uh, the present uh, administrative mechanism who turn into entrepreneurs and uh, tap the market. And what is bad uh, environment? That is when only 20 projects are implemented out of a potential 100, but uh, in uh, that 100 uh, potential projects, uh, two things depend on competences and human ha capital, that is uh, productivity and effectiveness uh, of these uh, 20 selected uh, projects, first of all, and uh, secondly, that is uh, better willingness uh, to communicate and uh, make projects uh, and the human capital of higher quality, even uh, in uh, bad uh, environment will uh, grow these 20 projects into 23, so it will increase economic growth. Thank you very much, and dear colleagues. I'm really very sorry, but the willingness of uh, experts to talk with uh, Mr. Kuzminov and Sinelnik of Murilov somehow has eaten up all the time uh, for questions. So formally, I can give a chance uh, to the floor to ask one brief question. Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, I'm Roman Akperov, uh, rector of private uh, university Rostov and Don, uh, and we believe that uh, private education increases the quality of education. And uh, it is really sad to hear about budget and non-budget. And in the condition of digital transformation, how larger are our chances uh, to attract investment to private education development? I believe that is a question to both. Uh, Panelists, I believe that it grows really sharply. And now private uh, higher educational institutions, so objectively they were suppressed in competition, but uh, as soon as uh, we switch to short courses and micro degrees, uh, that is the environment where more mobile uh, private uh, higher education institutions can get a chance. I will be brief, uh, colleagues, I didn't want to offend anybody. I did not name any bad higher educational institution, though I can, or good, though I can as well. But the trend, the general education trend, is like that. So I didn't want to offend anyone. If I did so, please accept my apologies. 
Dear friends, if you can count to 10, stop at 8. So I would like to thank all the participants, first of all, our keynote speakers and experts, and the audience that listened to this polylogue attentively. Thank you all very much.